Professor, Professor Schippers, may I ask you some questions? Yes, of course. What do you want to know, Rico? What is agnetology? That's a, um, so in these uh, talks we talk about uh, um, human behavior and how you can um, well, influence it, but you can influence it in a negative or a positive way. So you can manipulate behavior or try to nudge behavior in a positive direction. So what is agnetology? Agnetology is really interesting because um, it's a pretty recent term. Um, let me tell you a story about this. So, uh, not so long ago, um, I think it was probably the 80s um, or the 70s, smoking was normal. Everybody was smoking cigarettes and there was cast doubt if this was bad or good for, or at least not bad for human behavior uh, or neutral. So you had an advertisement where pregnant ladies were uh, well, there was a pregnant lady smoking cigarettes and she said, oh, this relaxes me so much. And then you think, well, oh my God, now we can't do this, this anymore. This would be, and you can't even imagine that this really happened. So this is a real advertisement. So I think uh, even in science, there, was, um, there were articles that said that there was no uh, negative effect, health effect of uh, uh, smoking. And there were, of course, articles that said there were negative health effects of smoking. But the... Um, the um, um, let's say tobacco industry had a stake into saying it's not a negative effect on uh, health. So uh, this was called was almost um, putting up a literal and figuratively a smoke screen to uh, dilute the results, which were pretty cl clear actually if you looked at really the good scientific articles about this that didn't have ties with tobacco industry. So um, this was actually. An example of agnetology. So, for follow the science, we try to explain certain phen phenomena in, in psychology. And you mentioned agnetology, and I had never heard of it. So, I looked it up on Wikipedia. Within the sociology of knowledge, agnetology or agnatology is the study of deliberate, culturally induced ignorance or doubt. Deliberate, culturally induced ignorance or doubt. So. Somebody is yes. doing it on purpose. Yes, and usually because there is a, 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 a monetary gain to be, uh, there's something to be gained, but for, for the one doing it. So on Wikipedia it continues, typically to sell a product or win favor, particularly through the publication of inaccurate or misleading scientific data. Yes. That's where I became interested in this. Uh, everything revolves around science today. Yes. So. That's why we call this follow the science, but uh, we want to have independent science. But science is not always independent. And uh, people, uh, there's finances, and so, so research projects get financed. And if you get finance from the tobacco industry or via via, uh, then the, the scientist has a stake, at least uh, the scientist also has a stake in, in, in publishing positive results for the... And that isn't to say that they always do that. Uh, I know many scientists who wouldn't do it even if they get financed from uh, uh, the tobacco industry or whatever, vaccine industry or whatever. But still there, of course, there's a big gain to... Uh, are there fail-safes? Are there mechanisms in science, in scientific research, in, in the environments that you work in to prevent commercial interests of, of mm -hmm. getting a certain outcome? That's a good question. There is a huge debate that's been going on for years. Um, and I know when I was a student, we, still, uh, we also had that debate. Um, it's difficult. Uh, I know that I had um, a research that was part, in part financed and um, I, I had negative results and I presented them to them and I never got another uh, um, grant from them. But I, I, I didn't feel I could do anything else. And, um, yeah, so it's usually up to the uh, individual um, individual researcher and of course you write in the contract that even negative results uh, are going to be reported and things like that. But it still uh, boils down to also to the how um, um, ethical is the researcher uh, themselves. What can I do as a layman, I'm no scientist, reading these papers trying to assess if it's genuine or not? That's a very good question. 
Um, so usually, yeah, you, you trust experts, but I, I would say trust your feelings as well. Because um, if, if everybody, usually there is no consensus. So if they say there is clear consensus about a, one topic, then I, I get suspicious myself. <laughs> that's when you get suspicious, okay. I get suspicious because I think in science I've never seen consensus because that's the whole point. We don't really agree with each other. Because if we do, then, you know, science is building on each other. So if somebody has a result and a good research result um, is what I learned, uh, will raise more question th questions than it answers. So there is no definitive answer about one topic. Um, so I would say uh, do your own research and also trust, follow your heart again, I think. Because if you, if you feel hmm, something's wrong with this, don't, you know, so in the 80s, I would say don't smoke or don't smoke too much, maybe very, very little. Uh, they also say something positive about wine. I'm not sure about that. I hardly drink any wine, but uh, it's always good to be very, very moderate in things. <laughs> and enjoy life also. And enjoy life, yes, yes. And, and uh, so it always boils down to these feelings, because people sometimes think that if there is a big problem, there has to be a big answer. But for a big problem, you sometimes can do a very small intervention and that already helps. And so, yeah, you have to get the feeling again and, and do your research. Do try to read these articles. So the tobacco industry lost in the end. Yes. So there's hope. There is no? hope that for every aspect in life where we see this agnotology, that there will be a turning of the tide. So I'm really hoping for a lot of things that go wrong in society and have all the wrong incentives, basically. Um, so there are a lot of perverse incentives in society and I hope the tide will turn. So we called this series Follow the Science, but what we imply is uh, be your own scientist and be critical of what you see, what, what's presented. Yes. Don't just follow. Exactly, exactly. That's why it's a little bit, uh, let's say, it's not cynical, but it's, what, how, how would you call that? Uh, we are following the scientists and see if they're, <laughs> what they're made out. <laughs> are we following the scientists? Yeah, you can follow the scientists, but uh, yeah. It's the same with gurus. You know, if you have, a scientist can be a guru because, you know, they have some certain knowledge and you have to see, okay, does it speak to me? And do, do I believe what this person says? Do they, have, do they have other incentives to say what they are saying? And uh, especially when it's counter-narrative, like everybody is saying uh, this, and then there is one or two scientists saying something else, then usually I start listening because I think, hey, they have, a, this is really a big hurdle to say something different than the rest of society is saying. Yeah. What I would do is first follow the money, <laughs> yeah. find out what's the financial incentive. Yes. And second, uh, is there room for debate? Yes. So if you exactly. claim something, yes. And you claim that it's on behalf of science or scientists. Yes. Uh, are you open for debate? And if you're I not, I totally agree. <laughs> that that is a very good um, uh, marker as well. I think if there's no room for debate, then it's not science. Uh, exactly. Thank you very much.